This is a special edition of Your Voice, Your Vote. Now at 6, the race for Portland Mayor Debate 2020. The city of Portland is facing an unprecedented challenge from the coronavirus crisis. Businesses forced to close or drastically reduce service. Thousands of Portlanders out of work, worried about how they'll pay next month's rent or mortgage. Grocery store shelves bare of necessities like disinfectants and toilet paper. Leadership is key, especially in a time of turmoil. In less than a month, May 19th, Portlanders could elect a mayor who will be in charge of helping Portlanders get past this crisis. Among their choices, Teresa Rayford, a community organizer and business owner. And we'll also dive into another topic that is a huge issue in Portland, homelessness. What will be the biggest challenge facing the city of Portland over the next year as a result of the COVID-19? And how will you respond to that challenge? Teresa Rayford, your chance to answer the same question. You have one minute. And, um, and though we can't stop a pandemic from happening again, um, we can work directly with our community members to build accountable frontline leadership, which is the call to action to national leaders um, to, to handle this pandemic, to make those decisions that are clear and informative, that give people a direct line to resources and advocacy. Um, one of the things that I can just attribute to the work that I've done in community over the last 10 years since the death of my nephew um, is community organizing. And in community organizing, we organize as frontline responders to communities in crisis. And so I'm hoping that after the May 19th election that we're called upon to help work with the administration that's currently in office to go ahead and develop that strategy for enabling our community to be resourceful within itself. Thank you. Teresa Rayford, thank you for that. Here we go. There's bound to be long-term economic impacts from the coronavirus, some forecasting economic instability for two years. How will you ensure Portland avoids a recession? Where will funding come from to keep the city afloat? Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm, I'm happy that you asked that question. Uh, this past week, I held a coalition meeting with a lot of people in the cannabis industry. And before coronavirus had hit Portland, we were already talking about how to reutilize the tax money that's coming in for public safety to reinvest in housing and public services that provide direct health and resource advocation. So um, I think that by partnering with those industries that are right now currently still able to make money, uh, that helps us stabilize from a venue of monetary support spending, but also the budgeting. Uh, we're seeing that care instead of policing and jailing is more assertive in our community as a response to the COVID virus uh, pandemic. And people like myself who have been on the front line struggling for human rights, uh, we've always said that we needed to have more impact with health and housing. So we'll just continue to utilize federal funding and our state tax codes to go ahead and make sure that policy is funded for that. Teresa, thank you. Welcome back. We want to get to the questions you sent us for the town hall. Matthew Johnson wants to know, if elected to the position of mayor for the city of Portland, will you cooperate with federal officials to enforce immigration laws, or will you continue the city's current practice of being a sanctuary city? And for this question, we begin with Teresa Rayford. Um, I'll continue with the city sanctuary practice, but right now, uh, as I answered in one of the interviews that we got that's right now posted on Teresa Rayford for mayor.com, um, there are, it's symbolic, um, and I said that when it was passed in 2017, uh, we need to add more grit to it. We need to add more protections for people. We need to be more concerned and sincere in what we say when we use the word sanctuary in regards to how we're safeguarding our communities from organizations like ice. Teresa Rayford, you answered the question first. You get 30 seconds for rebuttal if you'd like. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to say that um, I, I was born in Portland and as someone that is on the front line, that is a community advocate for communities uh, from the BIPOC communities, um, we need to realize that there is no sanctuary when there is no structure under the law in our city that provides protection for us. There's community members that cannot even call our local police for support. So when we talk about having a sanctuary from organizations like ICE or any kind of national 
nationalist uh, organization, uh, we don't have clear channels of support for communities, and that does need to be developed. And I do look forward to building that within our community with communities that are most effective because Ted is not doing the work. Right. Uh, the platform that he's provided is propaganda. You're out of time, Teresa, but thank you for that. We appreciate it very thank much. You. We'll begin with Ted Wheeler for the next question. In 2018, Portland voters sent a clear message about their views on campaign finance. They overwhelmingly passed specific limits on campaign contributions as well as other transparency requirements. How can you ensure to voters that you respect their wishes? Mayor Wheeler, starting with you, how do you answer that in light of the complaints about your campaign? And just today, the auditor's office found you violated three rules. You have one minute, sir. Yeah, first of all, let me be clear. I've always supported transparency and disclosure. We're doing this on this campaign. Um, we're still trying to get clarification out of the auditor's office in terms of what the new rules are. There's a lot of confusion about that. But what we know based on the information today is every single one of the candidates here today is in violation of the rules. If you put a yard sign up, if you use social media, if you sent out a mailer, if you did anything that did not disclose your top five contributors on that media, you're in violation. We checked earlier today, we're all in violation of that. So we're looking for clarification. Uh, we're seeking clarification. We support transparency. Professor Rayford, you have one minute to answer the question about transparency. Go ahead. Thank you so much. And, uh, and speaking of transparency, our campaign had made the decision to not participate in the open and accountable elections because we did want to be transparent with the community at large. We're a grassroots organization and most of our donations have been, you know, $65 or less. Um, I think we've gotten a couple of 250s, a couple of $50 recurring, um, and a lot of in-kind volunteer support. And the fact that we're here at this level, at this forum, uh, in alignment with candidates that have raised, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, through the city's program, um, that just attests to the need for campaign finance reform and the level of uh, accountability and some type of oversight. When we went through the training, I didn't see where it was a really transparent process. So I believe that using the uh, Secretary of State's website to see where our money is going and where it's coming from, I think that that's the best and clear way that you can find out directly who's paid into our campaign and exactly where those dollars have gone. Teresa Rayford, the question to you, what is your position in the city of Portland sweeping homeless camps? You have one minute. Thank you, and thank you for asking me that question. I've been, I've been against uh, the sweeping of homeless camps since as far back as 2012. And one of the things that I have to consider in the way that I feel about that is over 25 years ago, I worked for Dr. Rendleman at the Old Town Clinic. And every morning, we supported the health needs of the people who were waking up outside. And they're not just waking up outside in a, in a, you know, in a situation that is unsafe, um, but there's a lot of health-related issues that are happening, and there's not enough uh, effective resources within our city bureau's outreach plans. Uh, the fact that we want to, and that we've already said that we're going to be decriminalizing poverty, what that will take is someone who has the experience of what that looks like. Uh, we need to make sure that we're looking for secure and sustainable housing and resources that are available throughout our city, not just in downtown spaces. Thank you. All right, Teresa, thank you. Teresa Rayford, it's your chance now. One minute to answer the question, how do you plan on helping renters while not sticking homeowners with more property taxes? Go ahead. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and piggyback off of what Ozzy said in regards to seeing that we utilize the moratorium funding um, in a way that directly influences sustainability. But what we also have to look at is, in my opinion, someone that owns property and that provides housing is a small business owner or might be a large business owner. But I think that we need to take a critical lens at how we're supporting the landlords in our cities that are providing uh, critical housing to communities. And I've had this issue before with families that are getting housing through the Portland Housing Bureau and the Section 8 programming that that our city does not invest in the upgrades and the rehabilitation so that we can have sustainable housing for people. So I just hope that our current administration looks at that as an opportunity so that we can get some type of foundational support in there. That'll make sure that we don't increase our unhoused community. Teresa, thank you very much.
Welcome back to the K2 Debate 2020 in the race for Portland mayor. Time now for our candidates to wrap up this debate with their closing statements. We want to begin with Teresa Rayford. And Teresa, you have 90 seconds. Go ahead. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to say one last time that um, I'm, I'm running this race because our community has asked me to run. Um, I've been an advocate for 10 years since my nephew Andre was killed on September 26th of 2010. Um, today just happens to be his birthday. I find it disheartening, again, that we're not speaking about the gun violence that's happening in our community. And I think that we need leadership that can connect the dots to what the violence is happening, our unhoused community is experiencing. Um, just a lot of the things that we're all affected by on a daily basis. Um, we need engagement. We need leaders that can come and show up in communities that can bring communities together so that we can be effective leaders because of that inclusion. I've been fighting on a platform and struggling on a platform for transparency, accountability, and with our campaign, I hope that people will see that as a grassroots organization that we brought that to the table um, for all the people that support our campaign, the hundreds of donors and the hundreds of volunteers that have kept us afloat. Um, thank you again for giving us this opportunity. My name again is Teresa Rayford. You can find out information about our platform, including our people's platform on TeresaRayfordForMayor.com. Thank you. And finally tonight, a reminder, the May primary takes place on Tuesday, May 19th. If one of the Portland candidates for mayor receives 50% plus one vote, that candidate wins outright in May. If not, the top two vote getters will face each other in November. Thanks to all the candidates for taking part in K2's debate 2020, the race for Portland mayor. If you missed any of this debate, you can watch it again Sunday morning in a special one-hour edition of Your Voice, Your Vote, starting at 8.30 a.m.